Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today we read one of the most beautiful stories we have in the season of this great Lent, the story of the prodigal son. It's a well-known and also a well-loved story. There's so many things we can learn from this story and there's so many things we can talk about. And before we get into the details of the story, I want to review quickly about the different stations, the different things we have covered so far in this great Lent. We talk about this great Lent is a, the most beautiful and the most important spiritual season. We said if there's any opportunity for you to grow spiritually, this is the season where we can grow. The, the journey begins initially with the gospel that where Christ says, whenever you pray, pray to your Father in heaven and close the door. And whenever you fast, you fast your Father in heaven, fast in secret and pray in secret. Make sure we're not doing anything out of outside appearance to get the praise of men. And then the church also stresses on the fact that it's trying to tell us that our God is a father figure. He's a father figure who loves us and he cares for us and he wants to establish this relationship with him. And next, the week after, we talk about the treasures, how important it is to look inside your heart and really look, what is my treasure? What do I consider to be most valuable in my life? Because what I consider to be valuable, my heart will follow meaning my priorities will follow, my thoughts will follow, my talks will follow, and so on. Given that this is a relationship of frustration between a father and a son, given that we have to also look into our hearts to figure out what is really important, we have to be ready. Because as soon as you start on the journey and start climbing on that mountain, who are you going to find waiting for you on the road? Satan. Satan will always be waiting for us. Satan will be always be waiting for us. And as soon, you know, many tell us that when, as soon as we start Lent, we start to see problems we have never seen problem before. We start to see challenges we have never seen. We get, we, get, we get depressed, right? That's how it is. As soon as we start climbing up on that mountain, we're going to go see God with Moses, just like Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. As soon as we go up any mountain, go up any steps in spirituality, we'll always find Satan waiting for us to tempt us. And then the church starts to establish for us practical examples of that fatherhood. And today we start with one of those examples, the story of the prodigal son. To give you some context, context Jesus was explaining this story to the Jews. Ashen, the Jews, they thought of themselves that they're the chosen people. They thought that they're the best. They thought that they are, they know the scriptures, they know the commandments, they know what God wanted, so they knew it all. But they thought of themselves, hey, we're the old, we're the good people, we're the good sons of God, God has chosen us. So God was telling them, no, 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 it doesn't look like this. Outside you look like you know all the commandments. But see, inside your heart, your heart is very hard. Your heart is very, very hard. You're not showing patience to, un to other people. That you can find the people who are neglected, the people who can, you can call themselves are not obedient to the commandments, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, they are the ones coming to me. They are the ones who are believing me. But see, into the Jews, you think yourselves, you're better than others. It's, uh, it's a lesson to all of us who call ourselves Christians and come to church often. Sometimes... We can have what we call the older son syndrome. The older son, and a khadim kabir, and I have, and I'm well educated. I know everything. What are these people doing? What is this? What? I know. No one else knows more than me. We get the older son syndrome, and because of that, our heart becomes very hard. If I had the broken or I had who he needs help, uh, our eyes become very judgmental. Just like this older son. He was starting to nitpick on him. That son, we, usually people who are prideful, also they have this uh, rudeness in them. Since when you call your father uh, your, your son of yours? Your son of yours? You call your father your son of yours? You call your brother your son of yours? That's what happens. That's what happens when we're prideful. 
the younger son, the younger son who goes and he leaves the house. I was, cont I was contemplating more about this. And sometimes we focus so much about the son who leaves the house. And maybe he leaves the house because of, uh, you know, bad perceptions. Maybe because he feels that he is better off by himself. He feels that maybe he is under too many restrictions. But I wonder if we go inside that house and we really study what is happening inside the house. Sometimes we can make quick summaries or assumptions just from things on the outside. The boy left the house. The little kid left the house. But I wonder if we go inside the house and, fit and really look, what is happening inside the house? Could it be because, of course, the hero of this story is the is the father, his beautiful, compassionate father. But could it be maybe his brother who was too harsh on him? Could it be the servants who may be judgmental on him? Could it be that he was looked down upon? Could it be that they were expecting perfection from that person that leads people outside? Maybe he was given a suggestion that outside is better, not inside the house. Outside is better. Something we need to all to think about. Could we be doing things inside our homes that could be damaging others? Could we be maybe extra judgmental or extra strict or extra harsh or extra not listening? What could it be? What could it be? could make people leave. The son goes, and of course, he wastes everything. And that's what happens. When someone leaves the father's house, they, they become lost. When we leave the church, when we leave our father's house, when we leave what we have, thinking if something better could be outside, we run the risk of losing everything. We run the risk. So we really have to be very careful. I'm not saying we're the best. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm saying just to be careful. Because when we leave, we run into the risk of losing things. The person, the young child, he lost. And that what happens. When you start to lose, you become hungry. When we leave the commandments, when we leave the church, we become hungry. This is why it's important that we raise our children in the church. This is why it's important as parents, as early as possible, to have consistency to going to church and practicing the life of the church and looking at your church as a caring mother. We are not perfect. The only perfect place is heaven. Until we go to heaven, we're stuck with this. <laughs> we're stuck with our weaknesses, with our insecurities. We're stuck with la our lackings. But we have to be believers in the church, believers of the commandments of the church, the rituals of the church, the sacraments of the church, the life of the church. That will keep us safe. And when we become hungry, we start to crave I don't know if that's what the, what's the expression in English. But when you're hungry, you start to eat anything. Anything that's in front of you, you start to eat. Because you're hungry. And chances are you will never be filled. This is why Christ says, whoever is hungry, believes in me, shall never hunger. Has faith in me, shall never thirst. Only Christ fulfills that thirst. Only a life with Christ. A relationship with Christ knowing who Christ is and having a real life with him, only then we will be fulfilled. Because humans cannot live without Christ. We think we can live without Christ. Because of his image and likeness, he is part of us. And when we're not part of him, we're missing something. We think we need something else. So he started to become hungry. Be careful. We have to self-evaluate. What am I hungry for? What am I the thing that am I seeking? What is the thing that I am looking for? 
And then he starts to crave the craziest thing, the pig's food. Ines, who are really hungry outside, you do the craziest thing to get attention. The craziest, the craziest possible things. Because you're hungry. You're hungry. But then we see the moment of change. When we say, when that younger child came to himself. Again, the beautiful church, the beautiful Orthodox church, and the beautiful sacrament of confession. When we sit with ourselves and self-evaluate my life honestly, where am I going? Where am I heading? Is this the road that will take me to the right place or not? We are neglecting the sacrament of confession. We are neglecting, exposing ourselves and our weaknesses. And we are seeing it more over and over and over again. We shoot ourselves in the foot because we are not opening our hearts. We are not looking into ourselves. We are not realizing that we could be going in the wrong way. We are not realizing that I could have a problem with myself. We hide. And a small disease turns into a cancer. And the cancer metastasizes, spreads over all the, the body. And then when they come to the doctor, it's already too late. We have to look into ourselves and continuously self-evaluate ourselves. This is what the church has placed in part of the system of the church, the sacrament of confessions and repentance. And so when I confess, oh, that's nothing is changing. You are changing. You are growing. I was having a conversation one time with someone who's confessed. He said, when I'm not changing, of course you are changing. Every time you confess, an idea that you just learned stopped you from a, one action. You know, our life is like what? It's like a growing baby. Spiritual life is like a growing baby. If a had is growing too fast, that means he's sick. Growth has to happen very, very slowly, very, very gent gently. But see, we're always growing. The sacrament of confession helps us to ensure that we're growing at the correct rate. And it ensures our directions are correct. You know that an, an airplane that's going from here to Egypt, if it just mis the pilot misguided the direction half a degree, half a degree after departing, say, from SFO, over that very long period of time, it will be, end up in somewhere completely different, either completely north or completely south. Just half a degree off. This is what confession does. It fixes our direction. Please, please, for your sake and the sake of your loved one, take confession seriously. Do not hide with your problems. Bring them up and try to, let's, we try to fix it together. Do not try to be isolated and then we find out that your life is a mess or you are going through it a lot of hardships by yourself. Come up and ask for help. He came to himself and said, what am I doing? My father's house have a lot of food. I am standing here hungry, wanting to eat pig's food. He came back to himself. And that was the turning point. He came back and then we see the most beautiful, the most beautiful picture of a perfect loving father. The father, as soon as he sees his son far away, he goes and he runs to his son, he gives him a hug, he gives him a kiss, he gives him a robe, he gives him a ring, and he gives him sandals. And each of those have meanings. I wondered why did the father not look for the son? Why did the father not go to the streets and find the son, try to find the son? Because the father is a loving figure. And a part of love is respecting free will. If you do not want to be here, I'm not going to force you. And this is why, you know, a youth of youth struggle. Like, why doesn't God change this? Why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God interfere? If he interferes, if he breaks someone's will, that means he's not loving. And can I hold your arm and twist it and only you have to love me? No. That means I'm not loving. I'm, I'm forcing you. Love has to be voluntary. It has to be completely by your own free will. So the father was not looking, was not out in the streets to find the son because he knew the son does not want to stay at home. But as soon as the father saw the son just making an entry, hatta from far away, that the son wants, he wants to come back. Immediately the father accepts. 
And the father goes and runs to the son. This is the action of forgiveness. Action of forgiveness is very, 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 very hard. Very hard. Lee, I have to realize in the integrahtini, you have hurt me. That's one. And I acknowledge it hurt. Forgiveness is not about forgetting hurt. You have to realize that the hurt has, has happened. And the hurt is real. And the hurt does hurt. But forgiveness is now I willingly self-sacrifice myself again. Yani A, I make two sacrifices. One, that I got hurt, and, that's, and, I, I, push, and I, I get it, that I got hurt. But then the second part of forgiveness, that I take the steps towards you who hurt me. You guys understanding what I'm trying to say? Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he forgave us, well, I forgive you. Bye. That's it. He didn't do that. He actually came to us. And then he had to die for us. There's two actions. It's the action of to forgive and the action to actually go to you and to ask, to tell you that I have forgiven you. He kisses him. To restore the emotional bond. He gives him a robe to cover his nakedness, to cover his filth, to cover his shame. He gives him a ring to restore his value. You are now a valuable son, still valuable in my eyes. A little bit dusty. It's okay. We'll work on it. We'll fix it. We're going to work on it later. It's your back. You're still valuable. Like a crumbled hundred dollars, you're still a hundred dollars. Yes, it's about a hundred dollars. Our value is the blood of Christ. And then he talks, takes him inside the house. And now we see the role of the servants. The role of the servants who are saturated with the will of the Father. The Father, will servants come. We have work to do. We have restorations to do. Yes, Father. Come, على طول. ينظف ويغطي ويدخل. Not say, you know, what is he doing here? لا ينفع يخش لما ينفع ما يخشش. No, the servants are saturated with the will of the Father. قلبهم نفس قلب الفاضي. Their love is exactly the same love as the Father. Their sacrifice is exactly the same as the Father. No questions asked. We are ready. A question to all of us. Are we ready to receive those who are outside? And then the story ends with the killing of the fatted calf. Everything revolves around the liturgy. We can be a church of having beautiful meetings and beautiful plays and beautiful landscape and beautiful buildings. is the sacrament of communion. In, in during the Great Lent, any Christian must be attending one liturgy a week. Any normal Christian, any Christian, one liturgy a week. As a full Lent, we have to increase, double it. You attend one, you attend two. And stand before the sacrifice and eat of it. Knowing you're not eating bread or wine, you're eating the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the promise, when you abide in him, he abides in you. And finally, we have to be aware what is our attitude towards others? What is our influence on others? How do we look at others? Are we judgmental? Do we look that we are better than others? Do we look that we are, our house is not sufficient? Maybe something else is better? We have to really be careful. May God give us grace and give us help to realize and appreciate the Father's love. Do not that He really truly loves us. That once we come back to him, everything will be okay. May we also be like the servants, not like the older son. It's still hanging up in the air. We do not know. Did he go inside the house? Did he finally celebrate? Or did he stay outside? I hope we do not have the attitude of the older son but have the attitude of the servants of the Father that we may accept others, realizing that we're all dirty, we're all smelly, we all need God's coverage and God's mercy.
and glory be to our God forever and ever. 